see everybody out. It's always a wonderful blessing to be able to gather together, come out and study God's Word. As we're given the opportunity to do so, it's always wonderful to be here and to see each and every one of you as we uh, come here to encourage one another to live that faithful life, to be faithful to our God, and to, of course, uplift one another. Of course, we're happy to see uh, the brethren who are outside, uh, though uh, you know, they, they still uh, need a cautiousness, still putting God first and coming to worship with us and uh, gathering outside and uh, singing hymns to one another as they're out there along with us. And, of course, uh, listening to the Word of God and praying with us. And, of course, those who are home uh, watching over Facebook. So it's just wonderful to be able to gather together. It's good to be here. It's good to always put God first. And as we bring these points out, that's what I kind of want to talk about this morning is how we need one another. Let's go forward to understanding that as children of God, as Christians, as one who has decided to follow in the footsteps of Christ, how we need one another, to help one another in order to remain faithful to God, to help one another to stand strong as we face the trials and temptations of this world, and especially during discouraging times such as now, as we continue to live through this pandemic that we uh, live faithfully to God. Most likely our van with our keys. They're very touching. So now we got a couple cars going off. Those who are on Facebook, we got car alarms going off crazy. Everybody's sitting their phones making theirs go off. So but uh we'll take care of that and keep on going. We need one another. We need to live faithfully to our God. So I hope that you open up your Bibles and follow along as we go through the scriptures this morning. And make sure that the Word of God is being applied correctly. And then as we see the Word of God being used correctly, that we apply that to our hearts. And that we follow faithfully according to the Scriptures. So the first one I want to bring out this morning is the simple point of being alone. Of why we do need one another. Is that when we get caught up in feeling alone... It's easy to get caught up in feeling discouraged. It's easy to get caught up in getting in depression and getting caught up and wondering why do I need to keep on fighting. And to first start off with, I want to go back to the beginning of time in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. In Genesis chapter 2, and reading in verse 18, when God created mankind, and God started off, of course, in verse 7, He created Adam. He formed him from the dust of the ground. And then he went continuing to uh, finish some things, it seems like, as you read through chapter 2 here. And he puts Adam in charge of naming the animals. And then you get to verse 18, and it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Right off the bat, and as we read through Genesis chapter 1, you read through the days of creation, God going forth and he created uh, of course, uh, he said, let there be light. He separated the moon and the sun. He created the firmament, separated the waters in the firmament. He went forth and created the living creatures of the world and the fish of the sea and the birds of the air. And every time and each day, it was good. It was good. And this was good. He said it was good. But then you get to chapter 2, and the first thing that we say that is not good is that man should be alone. So he created a help right off the bat. And I know that this here is talking about marriage. As you read through it, it gives us the point of when two come together, they become one flesh. And now you have two who are able to fight together, who are able to help one another remain faithful, who are able to help one another to stay away from sexual immorality. But the same thing comes into the point as a Christian. As a Christian fighting the temptations and the sins of this world, if you're doing that all by yourself, it becomes so much harder. It becomes so much more difficult for us to stand here and fight the good fight and remain faithful to the Lord if we have to do it alone. We need one another. 
we look at a couple of examples of those who felt alone. In 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings 19, and read along with me. And in verse 4. 1 Kings 19, and reading verse 4, says, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die. And said, It is enough now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father. Here, Elijah. Once again, you think of everything that has just recently taken place. And he had prayed that it not rain for and it did not rain for years. Then he came back and he faced four hundred false prophets and was victorious through the Lord. And then his life is threatened. He flees and runs away. And then he prays to God that he might die because it's no longer worth the fighting. He is all alone. That's what we read here in verse 10. Verse 10, he says, So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. Torn down your altars and killed prophets with sword, I alone am left. And they seek to take my life. Again. And here we know that he wasn't alone. The Lord spoke to him, telling him there's many more that have not bowed down to any idol. But he felt alone. There was no one there beside him encouraging him and strengthening him and, and, and lifting him up. He felt like he was the only one out there trying to lift others up. And no one was lifting him up. And so he was discouraged. And he felt like life was no longer worth living. <laughs> Many of the Psalms of David does he go forth and makes mention of times that he feels weak and alone. And that he is all by himself and facing these trials. And you don't see how there's a way to escape him as he prays to our Lord and God. And so we look to 25th Psalm here, Psalm 25. Psalm 25, starting in verse 16, it says, Turn yourself to me and have mercy on me, for I am desolate. I am lonely, he says here. I'm desolate and afflicted. The troubles of my heart have enlarged. Bring me out of my distress. Look on my affliction and my pain and forgive all my sins. Consider my enemies, for they are many, and they hate me with cruel hatred. Keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in you. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all their troubles. They will just read this and you can see David struggling here. You can see him trying to figure out how to keep on going. He says, please give me the strength. Please help me get through this. Please let me be the leader I need to be. Guys, it's hard to go through life as a Christian if you're doing it all by yourself. That's why God established the church. We, the people, are the church. We make up the body of Christ. And we're here to help one another in order to overcome these temptations, in order to help one another to remain faithful, to be there for one another, to lean on one another, to pray for one another, and we need that. We need one another. God is blessed. With you. Proverbs 12 and verse 15. We get caught up in being all by ourselves and we start thinking about our own thoughts and our own decisions and our own opinions. Proverbs 12, verse 15, it says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who, need, he who heeds counsel is wise. And of course, we can look through the Bible and see again that making sure you go to the right people for counsel makes a huge difference also. That's why, once again, we have our brothers and sisters in Christ. That's why we strive to have elders who have proven themselves to step up, men to step up in that position so that we can go to them for the counsel, go to them for advice. That's why we have each other here to help one another not feel alone. Now, we are all fighting this together. 
We are to have unity with one another, to have fellowship with one another. And when I say fellowship, I'm not talking about the gathering together here in the building or gathering together for a social meal. I'm talking about the unity, the faith we have in being one with the Lord, being joint heirs in Christ, and having a home in heaven. I'm talking about the fellowship we find in the Word of God. In 1 John chapter 1, if you turn along with me, that's where we read about fellowship. 1 John chapter 1, and starting there, and in verse 3. 1 John 1, and starting and in verse 3, it says, That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice in truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That's the fellowship we have. The fellowship of walking in Christ's life. The fellowship of knowing that he is the son of God. That he died for our sins. And that through him our sins have been washed away. If you've made that confession. If you've come forward and made known you've repented of your sins. And been baptized to wash your sins away. You've come up in fellowship with Christ. <laughs> And therefore, you have come up in fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. The unity we have together. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. Again, us all working with one another to help one another. Here it says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. To a perfect man, to the measure and stature of the fullness of Christ. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carrying about every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning and craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking truth and love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. He gave some, we, we had apostles, we got some teachers, we got some ministers, we got some, 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 some who are good at hospitality, some who, who are really good at teaching the Bible class and teaching the young ones and leading them, those who are good at teaching the adult class, those who are good song leaders, those who are good prayer leaders. We have one another to help the whole body be fitted together. But it's hard to do all those things all by yourself. Hard to do all those things by yourself. That's why we have the church so that we can help the body of Christ grow. So we can build up and encourage one another. So that we can be there and help teach one another of the things that we should be straying away from. And as we have our troubles sometimes and we go through those times that we're trying to overcome temptations, and we see brethren who have already done so, and we can be there, we can help one another overcome these trials together. Again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we read more about this. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, as it goes forth in the list and points out how we are like the body, an actual body of Christ. And as again, we all do our different parts. But just because you may be the eye, and someone else may be the nose, and someone else may be a muscle, and someone else may be the brains, and so, you know, we, we all have our different parts, but we all work together. 
And when one member of the body suffers, I mean, it just makes sense because we, we all have gone through it, right? When one member of the body suffers, the rest of the members suffer with it, and they pick up the lack when one part of your body is lacking. Because it's doing that, it starts to ache a little more too. It's what it brings out here in these verses. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse 26, if you read that with me here, it says, And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with me. We're here for each other. You know, that's saying about some team, some sport logo, or some, some other things, is that a team is as only as strong as its weakest link, or a chain is. Therefore, we have to look out for one another, our brothers and sisters in Christ. It doesn't matter how strong you can do it. There's something that we can be doing for someone else, that we can be doing for each other. When Paul started this letter to the church of Corinth, he had to, of course, approach the part that they are all caught up. Well, I was baptized by this person, so I'm better than you. But his focus here in verse 10 of chapter 1 says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no division among you, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. We are all baptized into Christ. And that's where our mind needs to be. And that's what we need to be teaching. And that's who we need to be looking to. And that's who we need to be helping each other to reach out to. The unity and fellowship that we should have together to help one another to continue to fight that good fight. We need to be there for one another in all things. Being there for each other in love. John chapter 13, verse 33. John chapter 13, if you turn along with me there. John 13, verse 34, 34. And it says here, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. How will people know that we are Christians? How will people know that you are a disciple of Christ? How will people know that you are the son of God, a child of God? Love one another. Yes, we can go forth and make mention of how we are to love our neighbors, love our enemies, love our family. We are to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. We are to be there and be willing to forgive one another. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Ephesians chapter 4. In verse 32, here it says, And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Again, being there for each other. And when we say that, that means when someone has done you wrong or you've been upset with somebody, that you are ready to forgive them. Why? Because you love them. Why? Because you love all. Why? Because God has loved you. God has forgiven you. And we are to be holy because God is holy. Turn along with me to Galatians. Galatians. That's supposed to be chapter 6 up there on the PowerPoint. Chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Read along with me here in verse 1. Verse 1, it says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Brother sins, approach them, let them know. But bear one another's burdens. Be there for your brothers and sisters in Christ. They are struggling. Let them lean on you. Go to them and see how you can help. And in verse 10 it says here, Therefore, as we have opportunity to do good to all, especially 
those who are of the household of faith. Again, I think that applies to all three points that I have in this book here. Our love, our forgiving, our caring, our kindness, our bearing one another, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ. We need one another. It goes a long ways when someone knows that they have made a mistake and someone comes and says, I don't hold anything against you. <clears throat> We're all good. It goes a long way when you know someone is struggling and you give them a phone call, a text, an email, a card saying, I'm praying for you. If there's anything I can do, let me know. Being there for one another. We need each other. That includes as we come <laughs> together. Coming together, seeing each other, greeting one another with a holy kiss. I know we don't practice that, but we have our handshaking and, and our hugs and, and our love that we have for each other. It goes a long way to help each other to continue to fight that good fight while we're not here together. We, we need to come together. We need that. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, and of course we see that we're supposed to do that upon the first day of the week as we have done today. As we've taken the Lord's Supper. Here it brings out, it says, now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message till midnight. And we know that it wasn't just one time that they gathered together upon the first day of the week. Because we see the example again in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. In verses 1 and 2, a reason I believe that Paul would have thrown this out there. He says, as I give an order to the church of the Galatians, so I do to you also. Concerning the collection of the saints. On the first day of the week, lay by in stores, you have prospered. Why do it on the first day? Because you're already gathering together with the saints. With your brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to come together. The Lord's Supper is to be taken as we come together. That is the example that, is the, the, that the Lord has given us as He instituted. As you come together, you take the Lord's Supper. Take this communion in His remembrance. Now, we're supposed to remember that throughout the week, throughout all our lives. But we need to come together. In Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, you read along with me here. In verse 24 says, and let us consider one another. Considering each other. Considering one another. In order to stir up love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. As in the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more. As you see the day of Christ. I understand. We've gathered together to remember the Lord's sacrifice. We gather together to sing praises to God, to worship our Lord. But that is not the only reason we've gathered together. We've gathered together for each other. Also, we need one another. We need each other in order to stir up love and good works. When we sing these hymns and praise God and give grace and melody to God by our hearts when we're singing, but we're also teaching and admonishing one another in these psalms and hymns and spiritual songs as we speak to one another in these songs. We should consider one another when there's an opportunity to gather together to worship our Lord. We need each other. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 46, and this goes further than just upon the first day of the week of gathering together, we need each other throughout the week. We need to keep that in our minds. We need each other throughout our lives other than just once a week. Because you read here in Acts chapter 2, 
And in verse 46 it says, So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplest, uh, simplicity of all. Praying God, praising God, having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Daily they gathered together. Daily they were studying. Daily they were going out and teaching. Again in Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5 and verse 42. Acts 5 and verse 42. And it says, And daily in the temple and in every house they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Sometimes we get caught up in saying, Well, do we really need Sunday night services and Wednesday night Bible class? Do we really, if you really want to open up your Bibles and see what it says, we should be gathering together more often. It doesn't have to be an official, official gathering, but we should be meeting in each other's homes. We should be getting together every now and then. We should be making sure that we are checking on one another and being there for one another to make sure we're all fighting that good fight, to make sure we're all living faithful to Christ. up your Bibles and you see that we need one another. And if you examine your life and you do things on your own, spiritually, it's so much harder by yourself. Final point for this morning. I believe I got a final thing. There we go. Continue to pray for one another. Remember, prayer goes a long way as we pray to our God. We need to be praying for each other. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and in verse 1. As it reads here, it says, Therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men. And I know as you read further, it goes into those who are of authority, but it says to all men here. We are praying for all. We should be doing that. We should be praying for this whole entire nation, for the entire world, for all the leaders out there. We should be praying for everyone. We should definitely be praying for our brothers and sisters in Christ. In James chapter 5, James chapter 5, in verse 14, especially those who have made known of their struggles, who have asked for prayers. Who we know who need our help. James 5 and verse 14 says, Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with the oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another. And pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. We've already talked about Elijah earlier in the lesson. But here it gives the example of Elijah. How he prayed to God and it did not rain for three years and six months. Why? Because he prayed to God. When he prayed again, it did rain. Your prayer can go a long way for your brothers and sisters in Christ. So make sure we're doing that. We are here for one another. We need one another. We need each other when we're all separated from one another, praying for each other. We need one another as we're separated from one another. We have so much technology. We have ways of getting hold of each other. We need one another. We need to come together every now and then. We need to come together and encourage one another to see each other, to know that we are truly there for each other. And don't ever forget that God is always there for you. The Lord is ready to strengthen you. We don't want to leave without extending the invitation this morning to any who have yet to obey the word of God to be part of this family, to be part of God's family. We just went through a lesson of explaining and going through and seeing how we are there for each other, how we should be there for each other. 
That's what we're offering to you. Is asking, offering you to be part of this family so that we can help you. So we can strengthen you in any way. And of course so that God can forgive your sins. So that Jesus' blood can wash them away. If you need the prayers of the congregation, or if you desire to be baptized, please let it be known as we stand and sing. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are my own, somewhere beyond the blue. Angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't. Sweetest friend. 